So we are in this sermon series called The Great Physician. And, and just to be clear, there, there are a lot of great physicians in the world, but there's only one great physician. His name is Jesus. Jesus came, and the, the Bible tells us in, in the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that there were people who came to him for physical healing, and Jesus healed them. And so, in a sense, he is the great physician. But people also came to him for forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is the only one on the planet, past, present, future, that has the authority to heal the soul. And so he is ultimately the great physician in the physical and also in the spiritual. And so the heart behind this sermon series is some lessons that I learned while uh, visiting MD Anderson, uh, the cancer hospital in Houston with my 16-year-old son. And so while I was there, I really uh, was observing some of the things that they were doing as a hospital, and I thought, okay, there's some truths here that the church can learn from, and so I wanted to bring those back and teach um, from the things that I've been learning. So today, this is the lesson we're going to learn. It takes many trained people to accomplish the goal of helping make, making cancer history. I underlined a couple of words in there. So a couple of the words are many and trained. So if you've ever been to MD Anderson, you will be overwhelmed by how many people work there. And not only are they people that are work there, they are trained. And they all have one goal. And their goal from the top down to the greatest physicians there to the hourly employees, their, their goal is to make cancer history. And I love that. And, and it's, you can see it in their logo. And in fact, I got this shirt. Um, if you go to MD Anderson for any reason, you will see this logo everywhere. And whoever designed this logo, man, they were geniuses because this one line speaks volumes. Because without this one line, you would simply be a cancer hospital or cancer center. But they took the initiative to say, no, our goal is to not only be a cancer center, but to actually remove cancer. And because that's their philosophy and that's their goal, people from all over the world come to try to find hope in these physicians. And I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about what would it have been like if there are many people who work for MD Anderson but what if they had their own mission? What if some of them was committed to removing cancer and making cancer history, and others like, well, it's not really a priority to me? Or what if there were people that were hired at MD Anderson, and they're on staff there, but they have never been trained? And they're just kind of doing what they want to do, whatever comes natural. And so you have this huge organization, and there's people just doing what they want to do. They got their own mission, and they're kind of all over the place. It would be chaotic, wouldn't it? They wouldn't be successful in what they're trying to accomplish. But if you go to that hospital, it is very clear that every single person in that, that building are on the same mission. This logo is plastered everywhere on their, on their um, computer screens, in their hallways, on their billboards, on their everywhere, because they want to remind not only their staff but also patients that they have this one goal, and that's to make cancer history. Now, I say that because a lesson that we can learn here at the church, what is our goal? Is it just to have many people? As Ken was celebrating up here uh, during the announcement time, he's very thankful that we have a lot of new faces. And some of you are new to Vista. Um, we are a 12-year-old church, and we've met in a variety of different places from a coffee shop to a cafeteria at the elementary school, and even a fire department. And so God has given us this piece of property, and God has allowed us to put this building in, into place. But nine months ago, we have seen our numbers literally climb about 100 people. And so on one hand, we can say, wow, look how, praise God. I mean, I agree 100% with what Ken is saying. Praise God. Look what God is doing. But if our goal is simply just to add numbers and not communicate a mission, then you're going to have a bunch of people who are here sitting, doing what they want to do. And in fact, if we don't train you, 
then I think we've missed the mark. We can learn from the hospital. The church should be about our mission is to make disciples. That's what Jesus told his disciples. In the purest form, this is what a disciple is. A disciple is one who becomes like his teacher. If Jesus is the great physician, he is the teacher, then our job as the church is to become more like Jesus. And so our logo, it's a little bit more complicated than the MD Anderson. They're straight to the point, line through cancer. But many of you have seen our logo, and you have no idea what this means. And, and I'm just going to take a moment to try to help you understand what it means so that way, hopefully, we're on the same mission. So if you notice, in the center is a cross. It's, it's a little bit lopsided, and some of you, you know, are struggling with that. You're like, okay, you guys, that's lopsided cross. I promise you the cross at Calvary wasn't a perfectly symmetrical cross, so just it's not sacrilegious. It's, this is what it means. There's three that are similar, the three green ones, and one that is different. We say at Vista Community Church, we want to be a church where you can come as you are. Even if you are on the outside, come as you are to the cross. As you come to Jesus, as you come to the great physician, he will heal you and he will make you into the person he wants you to be. The other three are green because they are growing, they are maturing. And so at at Vista, we don't simply want you to just come and sit and leave. I mean, if that's who you are and that's all you're going to do, that's fine. But that's not the goal of Christianity in the Bible. The goal in Christianity in the Bible is not to just see how many people can come and sit in a building, but rather it is to train up Christians to become like Jesus. And as they become like Jesus, now you can go help other people become like Jesus. So that's one of the lessons I've learned. Let me talk to you briefly about training. The gentleman on the top picture, it's Dr. Raza. Dr. Raza was Justice, my son's physician. He's the one who did the 14-hour surgery to remove uh, a cancerous tumor near the, the skull of the, of the, near the base of the skull in the top of the vertebrae. So very, very complicated. Not many people in the world can do this surgery. So we were told that this is the very best of the best surgeon. So here is an actual picture of him doing surgery. I actually snuck in the operating room and took this picture because I wanted to put this in my sermon. It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> Found this online. Dr. Raza can do the surgery, and we want him to do the surgery. But, you know, the day that my son went into surgery, uh, we got there early. They told us to get there at 6 a.m. His surgery was going to be at 8 a.m., and so we were there, and they started, the nurses came in in and, and the OR, and they started prepping him. And, and they kept asking him this question over and over and over. And they said, you know, date of birth, medical ID number, you know. And so every person that would come in, they would look at his chart, look at his badge and, or his little bracelet, and they would confirm this is the right patient. And I said, why are y'all doing that? And they said, we have 49 operating rooms. And today there's going to be 49 opera- operations taking place at the exact same time. When they sedate you and you go under, you don't want a doctor, the wrong doctor to come in and see the patient and like, oh, this must be my patient, and perform a surgery that you didn't need. But I guess it could happen if you're not careful. Forty-nine surgeries were taking place. In fact, their waiting room was bigger than this sanctuary. And so they told us that they should only have four visitors in the waiting room per family because there are so many surgeries taking place. If you've ever been to a, um, an airport, you see the monitors that tell you the incoming flights and departures. They have monitors throughout this waiting room, and every one of them has a, a medical number, and you're looking for your patient's number. So I knew Justice's number, and it would tell you in surgery, post-surgery, recovery. And so throughout the day, 13, 14 hours later, we saw so many people just come and go, come and go, come and go, come and go, come and go. At the very end, we're still like one of the only a handful of families that are there. And our little number for our son is is still in surgery. So I say that because if you're going to go into a big time surgery that, you know, you need the very best, right? 
But what happens if Dr. Raza leaves? What happens if Dr. Raza dies? Do all the surger- surgeries just, I'm sorry, you have a need, but we don't have a physician trained. Now, hospitals are smart. They're on mission. They realize that there's always going to be sick people, and they're always going to need pe- more physicians to, tra- to be trained to, to heal sick people. And so the, the, the one on the picture on the bottom is also Dr. Raza. He's in the purple scrubs. Now, this, according to their website, he's actually in a laboratory. This is not an actual surgery where he's not masked up or scrubbed up. He's actually now teaching other physicians how to do the surgery. And you know the cool thing about this surgery? We found out when Elizabeth went in there and she was in there, um, right before the, the surgeons came in, because they let us, they let one of us go back there with Justice. She came back and she told me. She said, "I was amazed. I saw big, huge TV monitors on the wall." And so, as she was telling me about these huge TV monitors, she said, "You know, that's probably how they do their surgery. They're looking at the monitors." And so, the point is, is that these doctors can do the surgery, but they also are training others to do the surgery. They have this saying that I was told, it's watch one, do one, teach one. So if you're a resident or an intern and you're trying to become a physician, a doctor, you have to go and watch the surgery. you got to take notes. you got to ask questions. But then at some point they say, okay, now it's your turn. you got to do it. And then you got to perform it successfully. And once you can perform it successfully, now you're expected to be able to teach other residents and fellows that will be following in your footsteps. Church, I really do believe that we can learn from this. We need a church that is training all of you to do what's right. Let me just give you a scenario, a hypothetical scenario. What if, what if when we took justice to MD Anderson, the very first person we saw uh, that parked our car because they had valet parking for free for first-time uh, patients, what if, what if we showed up that day, and Dr. Raza was there, and he's like, hey, here's, I'm going to park your car. Well, that's pretty, pretty good service there, and so he parks your car, and, you know, gives you a little claim ticket, and then you go up, and then, you know, we first go into the hospital, and then there's a security guard, and also a greeter, and they're, are you lost? You know where to go, and can we help you? And it's Dr. Raza. Like, oh my gosh, you just parked a car, and he's all sweaty, because he had to run back real quick, and so now he's, he's like, yeah, you know, you need to go to elevator D, Fifth floor. So now we take the elevator D, fifth floor, and so now we got to go check in justice, and we got to give them the insurance. Sure enough, Dr. Raza is there behind the desk, and hey, Dr. Raza, it's good to see you again. Now they're going to take him back, and he's going to go do all his little blood work, and, you know, the phlebotomist is Dr. Raza. We're like, what? You know, you're pretty good, Dr. Raza. So now he's like, you know, i got to get you prepped. You're going to go to surgery. And so now he does a surgery. He goes 13 hours in surgery. He's exhausted. He wants to go home. But you know what? Justice needs to go into the ICU for eight days. And guess what? We have an ICU nurse that shows up. And sure enough, guess who it is? It's Dr. Raza. Dr. Raza stays with Justice all night. He's monitoring him, and his, the little alarms go up, beep, 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 because his blood pressure is too high, and he comes in, and he adjusts it, and he gives him more pain meds. And so Dr. Raza's doing all that. And you know what? Justice finally gets up, and he's like, you know what, Dad? I'm, I'm a little hungry. Can you give me some Jello? And we call room service. And sure enough, Dr. Raza shows up with Jello, and I'm like, Dr. Raza, you are incredible. And then he goes, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm just a humble servant, so I'll do whatever's needed here at the hospital. And so now afterwards, you know, Justice has been there for eight days, and his kind of sheets are kind of dirty, and we're like, hey, can we get some clean sheets? Housekeeping shows up, and guess who it is? Dr. Raza. And that's just amazing. This is like the best hospital in the world. I mean, Dr. Raza is incredible. Now, if you went to that hospital, you would think that's something wrong with that hospital, correct? Probably. And yet, that's how a lot of times we see the people in the church, especially pastors. I know a lot of pastors who are like that scenario. They play worship. They come over here. Now they open up the Word and they teach. Then they put everything, they put their sermons online. They're, they're answering their phones. They're making the bulletins. They're teaching every small group because they feel like they have, they're the best and no one else can teach as good as they can. When that happens, you do a disservice to the body of Christ because it's not about Dr. Raza. It takes many people in a hospital to make cancer history, not just one surgeon. 
when it comes to the church, it's not about just one person, the pastor who gets up and speaks for 30, 40 minutes. It takes a lot of people, skilled people, trained up people who love the Lord to help point people to Jesus, to remove sin, just like we want to remove cancer. Bible tells us this. You have your Bibles. You're probably waiting. When are you going to get to the Bible, Pastor? I um, was thinking the same thing myself 15 minutes in, so apologize. So if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, and he says this. He says um, in verse 11, referring to Christ, the great physician, he says, So Christ himself gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be the prophets. He gave some to be the evangelists. He gave some to be the pastors. And he gave some to be the teachers. Those are five leadership roles in the church. And if you look, some are internally focused and some are externally focused. Some people in the church have leadership gifts that God has entrusted to. And let's continue reading. Verse 12. The purpose of these leaders in the church is this, so that to equip his people, plural, what does it say? For what? God has given some people in the church leadership gifts, not to do all the work, but to equip others to do the work. That work, equip, is literally the same word, means mend or prepare it's the same word that Jesus, when he called his disciples to follow him, it says they were mending their nets. They were preparing their nets. They were fixing their nets so that they can go out and work. The same word is true. Jesus is saying that when we have people come, the goal is not to see how many people we can come and sit and like Vista Community Church. That is, that is part of it, but that's not all of it. The, the goal is for us to equip each and every one of you for the works of service. The reason why this is important, let me continue to read, it says this, so that the body of Christ may be built up. When you think of the body of Christ, what do you think of? It's us, right? We are the body. In fact, if you look in the scriptures, there's no place in the Bible that says that the church is a building. It's always referred to as the body of Christ. And so we'll, we'll kind of dig down into that in a moment, but let me keep reading. So the Lord has given some to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. Again, all of us, we're one goal, we're to mature. And in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants. We're not going to be tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming, but rather, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become a very respect. We will, we, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. A lot of confusing stuff in there, but Paul makes reference to the human body. So the tumor that my son had uh, was removed, and it was very close to what it's called the brain stem. How many of y'all remember in your science class what the function of the brain stem is? I didn't really know much about it. The doctor started telling us that the brain stem really determines your speech, your hearing, your balance. You, you start messing with your brain stem, and it's going to affect other parts of the body. And so you got to be super careful because it's a very sensitive place. And I started thinking about that. I started thinking how God himself has designed the human body, right? The human body from the brain to the heart to the vital organs to your skeletal system to your white blood cells that fight infection, everything has a purpose. 
And if there's a part of your body that is not doing its job, then the rest of the body begins to shut down. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to say. If he created the human body, he also created the church, which is a spiritual body. In every part of this church, we have people that must be doing their part because if you don't, it's going to shut down. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I am so thankful for the people that we have here at Vista. Now, I'll be honest with you. If, if you were to come up to me today and say, Pastor, I need you to turn on the audiovisual soundboard, I couldn't do it. I couldn't turn these lights on. I mean, I'm not technical. I couldn't even do the VCR thing back in the day when, you know, the clock changed and that kind of stuff. That's just not who I am. When it comes to our budget, ask our elders. They talk to me about the budget, but our elders are really good at managing the dollars because they want to be good stewards of the financial money that comes in and out of, of this church. That's not my strength. In fact, if I had to lead worship, I couldn't do it. You don't want me leading worship. I'm, I'm really probably good at maybe two or three things. One is drinking coffee. I can do that. But I can't make coffee. In fact, I've never made coffee here at Vista. Someone came up to me the other day and they said, Pastor, the coffee machine is not working. I was like, I don't know how to, I mean, it's, I, I'm sure it's easy. I've just never, no one's ever trained me, you know. And so as I got that excuse, you know, no one's ever trained me. And so, but I can drink coffee. I also can greet you at the door. That's, that's a gift that God has given me. I don't do that just because I feel like I should. I like doing it. And I like to get up here and open up God's Word. When I open up God's Word to you, the people that I've talked to, and they say, Pastor, we like your teaching. The reason why they like my teaching is because they said we can understand what you're trying to say. You don't shoot over my head, Pastor. You don't have all these big words. And honestly, they're, they're, they're paying me a compliment, but really I'm, I only like think on an eighth grade level. So that's kind of, I mean, that's as good as it gets, you know. I keep the cookies on the lower shelf. Kids can understand what I'm trying to say. Teenagers can understand. And then most of you adults can understand as well. But that's who I am. But I can't do every other thing. And y'all shouldn't expect me to do it because the scriptures clearly tell us that I have a role is to equip people. Other people have roles to equip people. We not only want to be the body of Christ here in this building, but some of those gifts are external gifts, gifts of evangelism. We want to be the body of Christ in Castroville, Rio Medina, Hondo, Lacoste, Petrenko, San Antonio. We want to keep on reaching more people. But the way we do it is we have to keep on training more people. So let me ask a couple of questions here. Every part of the body must do its work. Do you know what your part is? Maybe you haven't discovered. Maybe you grew up in a church that never expected you to do anything. All they wanted you to do is come and sit and listen. Well, we need to figure out a way as a church. We need to figure out a way to help you grow and to help you find a place to serve and to help you to give back to this church and to strengthen the body of Christ. And so next week, we're going to have this um, handout in your bulletin. And so this is basically all the ministries that are available at Vista. If you are a member of this church, when you become a member, we tell you during the membership class, we expect you to be involved in a ministry. And the reason for that is because you're committing to this church so we're saying one of the commitments is that you're not just going to come and sit. You're going to actually come and serve. If you're new to this church, I'm not going to push you into a ministry. You need to figure out if, if we are a good fit for you as a church. And if we are and you want to become part of this church, that's the next step. So, and again, I'm not just saying that because we need more people serving, which we do. But I truly believe it's biblical. I believe it's God-honoring. I've often said, and, and not to give too many illustrations, but I've often said that some churches are like cruise ships. Y'all ever been on a cruise ship? I've never been on a cruise ship. Someday. So on a cruise ship, you pay your money, you come, and 20% of the people are serving you. 
80% are just going along for the ride and enjoying the ride. That's what a lot of churches' philosophy is. That can't be a healthy church. In fact, I think the healthier option would be a battleship. If you've ever been in the military and you're serving on a battleship, everybody's got a responsibility. If you're part of the body of Christ, you have a responsibility. You can't just say, well, no, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to come and sit. Well, you're not really part of the body. You're actually, to use this word loosely, you're becoming cancerous because a, cancer, a, a rogue cell, when it does what it wants to do on its own, it, it, it's a cancer to the body. It actually starts to destroy the body. And you know what? In, in the physical realm, what you have to do with cancer? You've got to remove it. And I'm not saying we're going to remove people who aren't serving, but I'm saying you, if you want to be part of the body, you need to be contributing to the health and the growth of the body. Now, I say all that. Um, you know, when it, just real quick, and I'm just going to take a moment to kind of just cast a little vision here, and I won't take too much time. So when I told you there were um, 49 operating rooms at the hospital, what would happen if they if they um, ran out of space, you'd have people that didn't have places to get operations right. I'm going to give you a real example. So my son, Justice, is going to have to go get what's called proton therapy. And so we went in there, and we were talking to the, to the oncologist, the radiologist, and he said, um, he said, you know, we're in no hurry to, to start this radiation. And he said, in fact, we have only a few machines, and we're backed up. He said, we got people on a waiting list trying to get on these machines. And then he said, the earliest appointments are 4.30 in the morning, and the very last ones are 11 o'clock at night. And he said, you know, so we're in no hurry to get you in. And I'm thinking, you better find us a way to get in this. And he's like, you know, we'll get you in on the rotation. So, but they're breaking ground for a brand new facility next door, and they're going to put in more machines, more doctors to get more patients treated. In fact, my son, the very first week he goes, his appointments are at 1030, not a.m., but p.m. Isn't that crazy? He's, they're going to go. Now, I say all that. Why? Because here are a few options. I'm just going to throw this out there. This little bit of tongue-in-cheek here, so, so don't, don't buy too much into this, but this is just the way my, my mind works. Either A, we go and build more, more space, which is not an option right now. We're just barely paying off this space, or B, we look at going to a second service. Now, I say that because if the hospital is serious about more people coming to get help, shouldn't the church be just as serious about seeing more people come to Christ? But that's going to require more workers. That's going to require more leaders. That's going to require more of us giving and not just sitting. Now, I'm just casting that out there between you and God, but that's my role as a pastor is to equip and prepare. So, that being said, let me close with a couple more verses. Shift gears just a tiny bit here. If you have your Bibles, turn with the book of Mark. And if not, look up here. I'm going to give you a real tangible piece of a, of a person who was healed by Jesus and then turn right around and begin to serve Jesus and other people. Here, here's what Mark 1, 29 says. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and they went with John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. So Jesus went to her. He took her hand and he helped her up. The fever left her and what did she do? What does it say? What? What? She began to wait on them. Here's a woman who is in bed, dying of a fever. They're very concerned. They go to Jesus. Jesus comes to Peter's house. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is there. Jesus heals her. She gets up, and now she's grateful, and now she wants to not only serve Jesus, but the disciples. Now, let me show you a, another lesson that I learned. And these, are, these could be many sermons, but I, just got, I couldn't get them all separated, so I'm just throwing them all at you at one time. So the little girl in the front first picture, she's 16 years old. If you look at her, she's holding a, a cake, and it says, make a wish. So her name is Zilia Sadigi. Um, 
you meet her, she's about as white as you can get. She went to Texas A&M. She grew up near Austin. Her name sounds like she's international is what I try to meant by that. Because when I first saw all the names there, Dr. Raza, you know, Dr. Hannah from Egypt, Dr. Um, Amid, you know, you got all these people from all over the world, the best of the best doctors coming here. And I saw her name, and I was like, okay, another person from another country. And we, we met her, and she's born in Texas, lived in Austin, Aggie. Anyways, too much information there. So at 16 years of age, she was diagnosed with a tumor, a brain tumor, that was three quarters of the size of a Coke can. And the doctors told her that, they told her parents, they said, you, you need to have this conversation with your daughter. Whatever you want to tell her, you need to tell her because she's probably not going to make it through surgery. So she went through surgery, and they said if she does make it through surgery, she's probably going to be paralyzed. So doctors went in, and they removed this cancer. And this, this article that I read about her online, you get a lot of stuff on people online. So she started immediately at 16 doing this to make sure she had all her fingers. She was touching her and she was doing a self-diagnostic test on her. She had already wanted to be a doctor since she was a kid. When she found out she had cancer and they removed this tumor and she survived it, she knew what she wanted to do with her life. She wanted to go and help others. In fact, she's now a doctor at MD Anderson. Oh, I don't know what I did there. Did I copy and paste twice? Sorry about that. So she's a... She's a doctor at MD Anderson. You can't see her face on the second one. But she's actually the first physician that we met when we went in there. And she, she found out I was a pastor. And she said, tell me about your church. And I started telling her about my church, our church. And, and, she's, and I was like, you know, I kind of want to talk about my son for a moment. And she's asking all these spiritual questions. And then she said, I'm a believer. And she said, my, my uh, physician's assistants, we're believers. And she said, you know, she looked at justice, and she just began to kind of speak almost a prophecy of healing over him. And she was like saying, you know, you're going to, I was 16, I had a tumor. You're 16, God's got plans for your life. And so at the end of that, I just felt like God was just giving me a spirit of peace. And I asked her, I said, Dr. Siddiqui, would you mind just praying for us? And she, we all held hands in her office, and she just prayed over our family. Now, I say that because... I truly believe if you've been touched by Jesus like Peter's mother-in-law, the thing she wants to do is to serve him. If you have been touched by physicians like this lady and she has been healed, now she wants to go help others. And so for us, Vista, maybe you're here and you need a time of healing. If you're here and you need a time of healing, we don't want you serving. We don't. In fact, my 16-year-old son they told him for six weeks you can't lift anything for 10 pounds, you can't bend over, you can't tie your shoes, you can't drive, you can't do these things. And so he is milking that. He doesn't take the recyclables out. He doesn't take the trash out. You know, he doesn't take anything out. And he's like, Dad, I need some more to drink, you know. And I'm like, hey, dude, get your own drink. No, the doctor said I can't do anything. Dude, that's not 10 pounds. You can get up and. <laughs> but we realize you need some time to heal. Maybe you're here for the first time, and I'm, and I'm talking to you about serving, and you're like, Pastor, I just need some healing. Vista is a place for you to come and, and just sit. I'm not going to push you into ministry. Just come and sit. You just need some healing, whatever's going on in your life. But maybe you're healed, and you're just used to sitting on the spiritual bench. God wants you involved. He doesn't just want you sitting and soaking. He wants you sitting and serving. So, with that being said, um, let me uh, close up with a couple of questions here. Application, and we'll close. According to what we've heard this morning, every believer should do their own part or the part to contribute. And then I'll ask that question again. It's between you and the Lord. Are you doing the part that God has called you to do? And maybe you're not sure, and if you're not sure, again, next week we have, we'll have these out in the four-year area. Not this week, but next week we'll have them out in the four-year area. Pray about it. You don't have to make a decision next week, but pray about it. Some of you like to be up front. Some of you can teach. Some of you, you know, can like to serve. Some of you behind the scenes. Um, 
you know a little bit about how God has made you. And if you don't, then let us come alongside you to try to help you figure that out. And so that's part of it. And the last part is um, sometimes, oh, I already said that, sometimes we just need healing. And if you just need some healing, we're here to help, just like people go to the cancer hospital.